The COVID-19 virus infection rate is difficult to predict. However, knowing the infection rate also lets you predict deaths, hospital protective equipment usage, hospital utilization, emergency room usage, medical staff requirements, number of people not infected, and ICU utilization. If you can simulate infection rate, then all these other metrics just fall out. A simulation's value is being able to predict the future at a lowered cost. It allows you to mitigate or avoid testing. The goal of a simulation is to minimize the number of computer cycles while at the same time accurately predicting the future. A simulation is a combination of a model plus data. The first is a model of all the systems. When I used to model rockets and included the rocket itself, the atmosphere, gravity, and so on, you can imagine the knowledge of the system you obtain by performing modeling. The second component of a simulation is the data used. In the above rocket simulations, there may be different data models for the atmosphere or for that matter gravity. This represents the data that goes into a simulation since it does not change the model structure but alters its output. I will take you through a quick journey that will help you understand the challenges of modeling and simulating COVID-19. Let's start with some basic facts about simulations. First of all, simulations are never perfect. They will, however, give you profound knowledge of the system you are studying. COVID-19 is difficult to model because there are many different infection scenarios in the U.S. I count at least four different modes in the U.S. Not only are there multiple modes, but these modes can change over time. Data also changes within the U.S. Let me give you an extreme example. Let's say you have a small town of 100 people. When COVID-19 starts infecting the town, it will soon be limited by the number of people and stop. Therefore, the infection growth stops, not because of contact tracing or social distancing, but because it runs out of people. In a large city like New York, social distancing may be what mitigates the infection rate. Any current simulation is validated against current data. Due to lack of testing, any current data is missing an important component, and that is the total number of infected people and where they are in the infection process. Also, this means that the model is missing asymptomatic infectious people that are unseen, but still infectious. Missing these two pieces of information handcuffs any COVID-19 simulation. This is a graph of COVID-19 infection hotspots as of April 13th. The four green arrows represent four different infection situations. Ideally, all four situations will be covered by the same model with only the data changing. This picture shows how come it's folly to use one simulation for the whole U.S. To simulate the U.S., you get much better results modeling each different mode separately. For instance, Seattle would be simulated much differently than Salt Lake City, and Arizona and California would be simulated much differently than New Orleans or Georgia. To simulate the U.S., you need to divide it into manageable groups, and then develop a different simulation for each distinct group. Ideally, a model will be designed robustly enough to handle all the different U.S. situations. What will change for each situation is the data. The first data example I highlight is the daily infection propagation rate which represents an infected person's rate of infecting other people. 33% work very well for New York. That means that each individual that is infected infects a third of a person each day. In other words, infects a new person every three days. This metric is highly dependent upon contact. It is also an average. The contact rate will be different, for example, between New York and California. California was able to perform social distancing very early, thereby decreasing the daily infection propagation rate. Other low population states or counties are advantaged by decreased contact. Another metric has to do with an estimation of how many people are infected but don't know it. This is called the percentage of known cases used to determine unknown cases. The estimate here is that out of 10 cases, four of those cases do not know that they are infected and are therefore unmeasured. You can see that this data can impact infection rates, the effect of other metrics, the calculation of cured patients, and the percentage of people that are practicing extreme social distancing. There are two metrics that work together, the initial percentage of the 100% social isolation people and the daily percentage increase of 100% social isolation. In other words, there is a certain percentage of the population that severely isolate themselves and therefore have no risk of infection. And then that population grows as the infection gets worse and people get more educated. Data that is dynamic like population movement is difficult to model because it's difficult to predict. Also, artificial physical areas expanding and contracting 
makes it difficult to model. There's a population of people that are unmeasured and that show no symptoms, however, are contagious. You only find these people through testing. Therefore, if you're not testing, then this population represents a vector of infection that is not included in the model. If you can't see them, you can't count them. Lastly, it's difficult to predict the percentage of people that are socially distancing effectively. This group of people can be subtracted from the total population, leaving the remainder of the population open to infection. That is an important number, but whose characteristics are unmeasured. Simulating something as complex as the infection rates of the COVID-19 virus leads to a great understanding of how the infection propagates, what you can do to change the propagation rate, and what information you're missing. Any simulation results should be taken with a grain of salt as they are educated guesses. Simulations will get better with time and will also be reusable with the next pandemic or epidemic. As time goes on and a simulation is modeled against real data, the model will continue to improve. Also, understanding will improve. There are many different data inputs into a model and it takes an experienced individual to understand which of these data inputs has the biggest impact on the model results. This is where expertise comes into play. If your data is damaged by missing data, for instance, not knowing how many asymptomatic people there are in the population, infecting people, then any simulation will lose value. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. Whether you are modeling a rocket, a pandemic, or people filling a stadium, all of that has value. You can perform COVID-19 modeling if you're a business, city, county, state, or country. Complexity grows as you move up that spectrum. I'm Jim Fitzgerald, a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt, Innovation Master, and expert on the Toyota production system. Good luck on your modeling efforts.